947. 947. Well, good evening. I'm in 1 Peter chapter 5. Love for you to join me there. 1 Peter chapter 5. I don't know of a preacher who don't enjoy preaching on elders. Wait a minute. I didn't say that right. I don't know of a preacher who enjoys preaching on elders. And now I've got it twice within two months here. For those of you that are following along in the devotional books, you have uh, maybe looked ahead further than I have uh, to realize that we're, uh, our word for this week is elder. And so tonight we kind of go back and remind ourselves using some different passages, but certainly none that are unfamiliar to you about elders. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday night uh, we talk about deacons again. And so if you've been here for that Many series we did on Sunday morning, uh, you know that we've, we've already reminded ourselves of a lot of these things recently. And of course, and of course our, our elders have met this past week, and they are going through those forms, and they are visiting with gentlemen as we speak, and in terms of as time allows uh, for them about the potential to be an elder, or a deacon for that matter, uh, within this congregation, and so I do ask tonight again that you uh, continue to pray for that, and I'm confident that there will be some names. I do hope and pray that there will be some men who are willing and desire, and that those names will come before you at some point here in the near future, Lord willing. Let's go back and think about elders for just a moment tonight in First Peter 5, and verse 5, a stop. Steve Shive, one verse, he read through verse 4, verse 5 says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Now I know there's a lot of debate there, and I stopped Steve on purpose early so that we could start here in our lesson to think about the, the role that you and I play in light of the elders. We talk a lot about who the elders are and, and, and what they're supposed to be and what their responsibilities look like. And we'll do that just momentarily again tonight. But, but a large part of what I want you and I thinking about tonight is what is my responsibility toward the elders? Maybe we don't talk as much about that or on those lines. And so as we think about who these men are and, and, and what roles God has given them of importance and responsibilities, I want to begin tonight by reminding you and I, there is an obedience. There is a submission that is required of you and I to the elders. And I, you can say whatever you want to say about 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. I'll go down any road you want to go down. Well, that word there is the generic term for older people. Yeah, that's right. Very good. I like it. It's also the term for the spiritual guides of, well, yeah, but that term is... All right, just back up to Hebrews chapter 13, okay? You don't like 1 Peter 5, 5? Fair enough. Hebrews chapter 13 is where my Bible is now. And I'm in verse 17. I'm in Hebrews 13, and I'm in verse 17. And the English Standard Version, English Standard Version, just simply says, Obey your leaders. Obey your leaders. Well, yeah, but that's the generic term for those that are in a position of authority. Perfect, excellent, you're a great Greek student. You got it exactly right. But now read the rest of the verse. For they are keeping watch over your souls. And my friends, that's not the president. You understand? He cares. I, I, I don't need to say it like that. But I don't think my soul is on the top of his priority list. And I'm not trying to be ugly or facetious. I'm just simply making a point. Whomever the Hebrew authors are referring to as they close this letter up here, the leaders that they're referring to is those that are watching over my 
soul. If I understand the New Testament correctly, that is my elders, my spiritual shepherds, the guides of those men that God has placed in accountability to lead and to work within a family, within a congregation, to oversee the souls, and they are going to give an account for that when they stand before God. Let them do this with joy and not, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Peter says that in 1 Peter 5 in the passages Steve read. No, let them do it willingly, not under compulsion. That's, that's the idea, the spirit, the attitude. You see, if, if we have to have men, then we're setting ourselves up for danger. We're setting ourselves up for, for this spirit of, of necessity rather than the spirit of willingness, the volunteer spirit. The spirit of eagerness. The spirit of desire. The spirit of God is asking of me to step up and I'm willing to do that in order to help the family. In order to help the people of God. When we talk about elders, man, there's a lot of things we could talk about. We could go back and remind ourselves this evening of the way that the Bible speaks of elders. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, Paul did, and called the elders of the church to come to him. And the word there is that generic term for older people. But I don't think Paul was calling every old person in Ephesus, was he? If you follow that passage out and you get down into verses like verse 28, of Acts chapter 20 and following. He's not talking to the old folks. He's talking to a specific group of folks. And so when we think about the term for elders, notice what he, notice what he says in verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Made you overseers to care For the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Now in those two verses, we have all three of those references to elders. Who are these men? Number one, they're older men. Well, we learn in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there are certain requirements that God has for this particular gentleman. Among which, I guess involved in which, are going to take some time for him to prove himself, and therefore, he's going to have to live some life. He's going to have to be an older gentleman in age. Thus, with age comes typically wisdom, typically experience. And so, we find the term elder. And we commonly use the term elder, as we've talked about. But now, we could... We understand that term has a generic meaning in the elderly, the older people. Someone who is older than I. And certainly I feel a responsibility or an accountability to be obedient and submissive, respectful to anyone who is older than I. But then also understanding this word in its specific use of a leader, an overseer. As Paul makes it very clear in verse 28, I want to talk to the overseers. I want to talk to the shepherds. I want to talk to those who are going to care for the family of God. We find in the Bible, not only is he an older man, but he's also a caregiver. He's a, he's a shepherd. He's a, he's a leader. Did you hear 1 Peter 5? He's a leader by example. We also find in the New Testament that involved in this oversight is is a care or an administration role, if you will. In other words, to administer the duties or responsibilities or decisions of a local congregation. And so very typically we call the elders the 
decision-making board. That's who decides. That's who determines. That's who gives the final say-so in matters of opinion or in matters of discretion or in matters of things that God has not already bound and legislated. They are in a position of authority. And so when you think about an elder, my mind thinks about someone who is, who is older. Someone who has experienced some life. Someone who has some wisdom. Someone who has some spiritual fortitude about them. Thus, not a recent convert type thing. Someone who has displayed the desires of God as we find in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and those 20 some odd things. But then, beyond that is this desire to stand in a position of responsibility and to be accountable. So with this role, with this leadership position in the Lord's church comes I don't know how to say it, maybe an extra eye of God. In other words, God is holding these men accountable for their shepherding, tending, caring. You know, as I think about the work of an elder, I I don't know how else to just kind of summarize it all up, but just with these three words, to lead, feed, and protect. When you think about that, Could you imagine trying to have someone appointed as an elder who says, you know what, I'd just just rather not lead. It just doesn't make real good sense, does it? I mean, 1 Timothy 3 never says, leader, does it have to? It says he's a manager. It says he's a steward. It says he's in control of his wife and children in his home. All of those things are implied, are implying leadership. He is a leader. Some are natural born leaders. Some are not. And, and it, it doesn't mean that everybody is, but it does mean that God desires for an elder As Paul writes to the elders at Ephesus, and as Peter writes to his fellow elders in 1 Peter 5, I want you to be an example. I want you to shepherd the flock. I want you to oversee, to lead by example the flock. But then not just lead, but but then to feed. You know, I I think about what Paul told Timothy about being apt to teach. Now, Jimmy, it doesn't say they're apt to preach, although that might be implied, and I appreciate you, brother. The idea is he's a teacher. He's willing, he's able to to lead in a Bible class setting, in a Bible study setting, in 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 a worship setting. Doesn't mean he has to. Doesn't mean it's like a a quarterly requirement or anything like that. But it means that he's willing. I I personally enjoy hearing from the elders. I enjoy them sharing. I get the opportunity to hear from them in a devotional setting monthly as they rotate. And that's a great joy to hear what's on their heart and hear what's in their mind and and as as they're teaching, as they're feeding Truth from God's Word. That's part of this. Maybe it involves Bible classes. Maybe it involves preaching. Maybe it involves private home settings. Maybe it involves counseling. Where they are offering advice and trying to help someone through a very difficult situation. That, those are all times and examples of how an elder can feed the flock. And then the last one, to protect. Man, this world is filled with religious wolves, isn't it? 
And we need somebody. God needs somebody who is, who is amongst us that is saying as a huge priority, we want to keep the church at Leoma pure. We want to keep the church at Leoma in a state that is glorifying to God. We are watching out. We are making decisions. We are analyzing and trying to vision where this could or could not lead in order to keep the church right in the middle of the road. There's a ditch on both sides. We want to be right in the middle. We want to be pure. We want to be holy. We want to be balanced. We want to be effective. We want to be truthful. We want to be reaching out. We want to be reaching in. We want to be helping people. We want to be benevolent. We want to be encouraging. We want to be edifying. We want all of that to be within the confines of the truth. We want to be loving. We want to be caring. We want to be compassionate. We want to be a light to the community. We want to be a place that people say, I need help and there is where I can get help. We want to be a family. And we want to be all of that within the confines of the truth. And we can be. And these men are positioned to be leaders in helping us to stay there, to be there, to be to maintain there and to continue to grow there and thus protecting protecting us from error protecting us from false teaching I, I'm going to be just pretty honest with you if, if a man stands here and doesn't teach the truth I want to see one of those three guys sits him down and that's including myself because we need to hear the truth. All of us. We need to be fed the truth. And there's too much going on in, in error out there anyway. And thus, the responsibility, the accountability falls upon these men to protect us. As I think back to Ephesians 4 and this passage as Paul wrote there to the brethren at Ephesus, it was he who gave some to be apostles. And some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors, teachers. Now here's what we got going on in our world today. We got evangelists trying to be pastors, teachers. And we got pastors, teachers trying to be deacons. And we got deacons trying to be hid. I'm picking on the deacons. What's my point? My point is, is that we all have a role within the church, and I am not a pastor. That, that combination there, pastor-teacher, is elder. That's what that is. As an evangelist, I am a, I am a teacher, absolutely, of the gospel. And as evangelists, we can all be teachers, but we're not all pastors-teachers. In the way that it's used in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And so, we understand there's a specific role here. It's even mentioned in verse 11. And the purpose is given to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body might be built up. We don't need preachers doing the work of elders. And we don't need elders doing the work of deacons. And we don't need deacons doing the work of preachers and, or elders. We, we need leadership in its proper position to where everybody understands and functions so that the body can grow. Deacons have a responsibility. Elders have a responsibility. As a minister, I have responsibilities. And we understand what those are given to us by God. And we can support each other and help each other and be there for each other and lean on each other. Absolutely. That's what a family does. But at no point am I ever an elder. I'm a minister. I'm a, I'm a preacher. 
I understand who my elders are. I understand when I need to go to my elders. When the situation is such that my elders need to be involved. And so should you. We all have a role to play. And when it's done and when it's effectively working together, the body is built up. I mentioned 1 Timothy 3 for time's sake. There's about 20 things there, right? You got them all? Just memorize them all in your spare time. Just memorize what it is that that biblical church leadership looks like. And then go to 1 Peter 5 and that passage that Steve read a moment ago and, and remind yourself of the attitude and the condition and the importance placed upon the work. Things like shepherding. Things like willingness. Things like eagerness. Things like being an example. Things like recognizing that when the chief shepherd appears, there will be an, un, there will be an unfading crown of glory. You go to 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, and you say, okay, here's what this man needs to be. And then you come to 1 Peter 5, and you say, here's how he needs to do it. And we put the two together, and we get a perfect picture of what biblical church elders look like. Biblical church leadership is really all about. You know, as I think about elders tonight, as I think about the role in which they fulfill, as I, as I think about their importance, as I think about the blessing of having godly men who are willing to serve, as I think about the priority that you and I should place on it. Well, they tell me, and what I've read and studied in, in church growth books, is that a congregation that is growing needs to be considering leadership every two to three years. Because what that does is that, that keeps it... You know, here's, here's what the typical member of the Lord's church does. Preacher gets up and he says, Okay, church... Today we're going to talk about elders and deacons. And most people go, ha. Been down this road before, twice, three times. What's he going to say that I don't already know? And you know what I say? You're absolutely right. You're a pathetic church member. I mean, a wonderful church member. You're absolutely right. Because we, we've been there. We've heard those lessons, right? And here we go again. Church leadership. I bet you they're going to pass out some forms here in a few days. And we're going to have to put them in a box if we're not careful. We get into this mundane routine and we'll find ourselves in a generation that don't have any spiritual leaders. And my friends, as much as the Leoma Church of Christ ought to mean to you for a hundred plus years, you send her through a generation with no spiritual leaders, and it will be devastating. It'll be devastating. Every family needs spiritual leadership in every generation, and the next generation is counting on us. Because as much as I love Jimmy and Denny and Johnny, they are going to go the way all of us are going to go if time continues. They will not live forever. And so these men need to be, must be, have to be replaced, added to, helped out. The next generation has to be trained and taught. And it's our responsibility right now. So as much as you get tired of the lessons, please realize that it's essential every time to keep a church mindful. Elders are not made overnight. They're not made in six weeks. They're not made in a year. They're not even made in six years. This is a lifetime. And it starts, well, 
It starts about where Oliver Urban is, just coming home from the hospital. Teaching begins there and goes all the way through. Helping men to desire. The last thing I'll call your attention to tonight is it's a passage in Matthew 18. You know the passage. The passage is where a brother has sinned against you and the Bible tells us how to work that out. So what's this got to do with elders? What's this got to do with church leadership? You realize that elders don't just make decisions, right? I mean, yeah, certainly. Somebody's got to make them and they'll be the men to make them. And they'll... They'll pray over them and they'll analyze them and they'll look at alternatives and, 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 and they'll see what the potentials are and the possibilities, what would be in the best interest of the church, what would be in the best interest of the family, and, and they'll pray over it some more and they'll think about it some more and they'll talk about it some more and, 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 and then they'll make a decision. That, that's, that's, that is part of it, absolutely. But i got to be honest with you, some of the best elders' meetings... I've ever been in are the ones when I got up, I said to myself, tonight we talked about souls. That's where the real deal is. We talked about conflict resolution. Ain't that what Matthew 18 is all about? Conflict resolution. Where does it start? Well, I, I, I can't add anything to 1 Timothy 3. I can't add anything. God didn't give me the authority to do that. But if I could, I would add number 21. And number 21 to the list of qualifications, if you will, would be a man who has proven himself to resolve his own conflicts. Because I'm going to tell you, as an elder, he better get ready. They may not be his own but they're going to be somebody's. As you think about what Matthew 18 says, it says you go first, right? And if they don't hear you, then you take two or three with you. And if they don't hear two or three, then you take it to the church. What does that look like? Who, who do you take it to at the church? Let's just march ourselves right up in here and let's just spew right in front of everyone. No, we're not going to do that. Elders ain't going to let you do that. Not for long anyway. They better not. You're going to go to them. You're going to talk to them. You're going to share your problem, your, your conflict. You're, you're going to share with them what you've tried to do and how it's not been received. And, and, and you're going to explain to them how you've gone through Matthew 18 and, and, and it's not working. And, and then at that point, they're going to get involved. Why? Because that's what elders do. They get involved and they listen. And ultimately, if things are not resolved, then you know what Matthew 18 says. You know what you have to do as a, as a congregation of church discipline. You have to let that person know. Their lives is not in accordance with God's will. The elders of a congregation are vital to its strength. They're vital to its stability. They're vital to its stamina. But they only serve in their vitality because of the source. And the source is Jesus. You give me an elder who's fully submitted to the cross of Christ. And I'll give you an elder that's got potential to help the Lord's church in 2017. You give me a man who wants nothing more and nothing less than for the cross to be taught, for souls to be reached, for truth to be explained in love. And I'll give you a man who can help a family to go down the path that it needs to be on. Don't ever 
underestimate the importance of elders in the Lord's church. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this, this day. Father, we are grateful for the time to be together. Father, thank you for Johnny, for Denny, for Jimmy, as they lead, as they feed, as they protect us, as shepherds of your family here. And Father, if there be other men to be added to their number, we pray for their heart, for their mind, for their spirituality, for their faithfulness, for their family, for their vision for the church. Father, we thank You for the wonderful men that this church stands on the shoulders of, that have led and served and given their all to be spiritual shepherds for the flock. We thank You that some of them are even still with us tonight. And we know there are many that have gone on to the other side of eternity. We thank You for each one. We ask You to bless us with more in the coming years and in the future so that this church might be even better and greater for the kingdom. We ask You to bless us as we search, as the elders meet even now. And we pray for this church right now as she stands in a period of of transition, and as the future we know is only in Your hands, we submit to You. Through Jesus I pray. Amen. As you think about spiritual leadership, as you think about the importance of God's family, as you think about the need for decision making and conflict resolution I want to ask you a question are there some decisions you need to make in your life elders can't make them for you oh they're praying for you to make it they're, they're praying for you to make that decision you're on their heart is there conflict in your life I mean conflict with the Lord that you need to resolve. Elders, they, they can't make you do it. They're begging you, they're pleading, they're praying for you to do it. They can't make you. As we sing this invitation song, you're sitting there not making a decision or not resolving conflict. As the elder comes, he wants nothing more and to see your heart in humble submission and obedience. Come meet Him. Share with Him what your spiritual life needs. We can help you in any way. Would you come as we stand and sing?